Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Hoping you're well. This is Brother Amin Asr, and we are here with our latest installment of the Muslim Super Dad and Wonder Mom video cast. Now, um, a little bit of background. What in the world is the Muslim Super Dad and Wonder Mom video cast? Well, what we recognize is that there's a lot of families who are looking to boost their parenting superpowers. Um, so that way, together, we can hopefully raise Muslim kids that build a better world. And so we've done some work to find some of the world's experts on various topics. And today is no different. Um, today, we're going to be talking about self-care. Now, I'm going to pull back for a moment. Life in general throws a lot at you. But as a mom or a dad taking care of kids, there can be a lot to balance. Whether that is morning routine, figuring out food, worrying about finances, worrying about work, thinking about family, fasting during the month of Ramadan, trying to keep up with our spiritual nourishment of reading Quran, attending the masjid, so on and so forth. A time can come when the gasoline can start feeling like it's on E, like we're running on empty. And I can say personally, um, burnout um, and, you know, the kind of feeling of depression that is related to that is something that I myself have experienced. And I imagine that many parents have likely gone through various ebbs and flows. But the question is, what does Islam say about self-care? Is Islam, uh, is self-care something that we should be thinking about? Hold on, I thought self-care is selfish. Is it selfish to practice self-care? Well, today uh, we are joined by a uh, special guest, uh, Dr. Abdullah Rothman. Now, Dr. Abdullah is a really, really accomplished and incredible dad. Uh, dare I say, a super dad. Uh, he's actually the principal of the Cambridge Muslim College. Uh, not only that, he's also the founder of the Shifa Integrative Counseling and co-founder and executive director of the International Association of Islamic Psychology. He serves as a visiting professor of psychology at Zayim University, Istanbul. He's also a visiting professor at the Islamic uh, International Islamic University of Islamabad, um, Pakistan represent and uh, Al Nilain University in Khartoum. Um, he ha holds a master's and a PhD in psychology and is a licensed professional counselor. You guys, I have a very long bio, okay? <laughs> Mashallah, Dr. Abdullah is the man, and we're really excited for him to be joining us. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Abdullah. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, good to be here with you. Hey, the pleasure is mine. The pleasure is mine. So first, um, where are you joining us from and how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing good. Uh, just coming off of this month of Ramadan. So I'm uh, in, the, in the interim of trying to get back into my, you know, sort of no normal routine, but bringing some of the barakah from that month into a new normal. Uh, so right now I'm in Abu Dhabi, UAE, but I'm usually... Uh, at least as of this past October in Cambridge, UK. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. And I can totally relate to the kind of calibration after Ramadan. It's so funny. I was actually making my coffee for the first time today and I like forgot the ratios. I was like, wait, hold on, how many grams? <laughs> and I was like, oh, let me, let me, I had to Google it. But um, so I, I want to first ask, so Dr. Abdullah, you know, going through your bio, you've, you, you, you've, really dedicated your life towards um, psychology and, and mental well-being. And I'm kind of curious, tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you to focus your life in this area. So, I mean, that's a long, that's a long story, <laughs> but I'll try to give you the condensed version. And, and really at the core of it is that um, for me, it was always about understanding the human condition and understanding within our human condition about development and growth of how we, how we not only understand ourselves, but how that self-awareness and self-knowledge is related to this notion of maximizing our potential. So I think I always had this notion of, well, there's more. 
there's there's more to the surface of this life and you know not just sort of taking you know you you get a job you become a doctor or a lawyer the two options that usually you're given by your parents you find the way to get the house with the white picket fence you have the three children and and then like you die with the most toys right and so for me it was about what 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 else is there and what more is there and so um, that you know very long story short converged for me with islam in my in my uh sort of quest to understand the human condition and development and and growth uh it was interwoven with spirituality um so like the word psychology what what drew me to it was the notion of studying the psyche which is the soul so this unseen reality to the human being and so that was always not separate from a spiritual sort of quest mashallah so that that's really what drew me to it there are so many nuggets in there brother abdullah that i really appreciated um um yeah my uh, my you know being a, a children's author was not part of my plan or my parents plan either um <laughs> but uh but alhamdulillah i'm, I'm blessed that, that 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 came here now this goal to be the best version of ourselves is one that I know I talk about and I think about even with my wife all the time. And it's interesting because we know like with newer kids, we, we, we recognize the value of role models because role models can sometimes showcase, well, what does it actually look like, you know, to be a Muslim in America? We, we think about that with our kids. But as I think about the role models for a business person, or the role models for a dad or a mom, like what comes to mind is like people who are working 24 seven, don't take any time off for themselves. Like, you know, they've got everything buttoned up. Like for the mom, I, I think about like, oh, there's a Mary Poppins who wakes up at seven o'clock every morning. And then like, you know, is doing two hours of work before the kids wake up. And then once they wake up, like, it's as if like the music is playing while like the eggs are being served. And then it's like, well, hold on. Like, this doesn't seem very possible. Like this seems a little bit of a stretch. And then and then I like try running towards that goal, but um, I'm curious, like, are there, are there role models of what, I guess, being the best version of yourself looks like or places where we can look to, to kind of see that? That's a great question. And I wish there was a, I wish there was a better answer. I mean, I'm not saying this is, a, is not Dr. Abdullah is like, well, let me tell you, you're looking at it right yeah. now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're all trying to be the super dad and the super mom, right? But uh, I think the, you know, we may not have a picture of that role model that, that looks like we would expect. And maybe inshallah, we'll have more and more of them as we start to understand these things through these platforms and conversations that we're having. And what we're talking about is how do we make something that we know sort of got, uh, wisdom and guidance maybe that is in the past and bring it into the context of our modern world, which is about the busyness and the trying to do all these things. And you know, if you look back not too far in the past, things were slower. There wasn't as much of an expectation for us to be everything and do everything. And then, you know, this idea of role model within an Islamic context, how we can't talk about that notion of a role model without referring to the Prophet, because the Prophet is the role model. And, 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 and I think some people say, well, how is that relevant? Because he lived in this other time and he was a prophet we're not we're not prophets you know like we're just struggling moms and dads but the reality is that if you look at the example of the prophet muhammad he was uh the, the super dad he was playing with the kids he was doing the business in the town he was taking care of a community he was doing stuff in the household he was managing people's emotions Right? He, was, he was doing a lot of, of things that we could say are balancing these things in this crazy world. But why was he able to do that? Yes, his status, but if you look at his practice and his sunnah, 
he was taking care of himself, meaning he was doing what he needed to do in order to have the capacity to serve so much and to give so much, right? And so we know that he spent the, the, the nights in prayer by himself, right? We know that he spent time in the cave by himself, alone with his Lord, doing um, reflective practice, essentially. We know that he prioritized uh, prayer and community and eating with people and eat, you know, and, and have um, being attuned to natural cycles. So all of these things are sunnah and they are all guidance for us to, to, to look to for a, an Islamic understanding of self-care because what is self-care? It's not necessarily just caring for the, the, the self that is sort of egotistical and driven to uh, preserve itself, but the notion of, well, what allows us to have more capacity? This notion of, you know, the best version of yourself. From an Islamic perspective, that the, the, what enables us to maximize our potential is there's a notion of baraka. We have to be able to tap into baraka so that we're not giving from ourselves all the time. Because when we give from ourselves, we get depleted. And so we have to have practices that allow us to tap in to this other energy that is from Allah that strengthens us and allows us to do more than we could do on our own. Allahu Akbar. Now, I'm, I'm curious. I think that that's a very interesting place where... Uh, um, there's a number of places where we can go, but I think the, the one that comes to mind is to double click on this concept of Baraka, right? And like Allahu Akbar, to be able to do more tapping into a different energy. I'm curious if you can either share like maybe personal examples or examples of what does that actually look like? Um, I'll tell you for me, one of the things I remember that, that might be related, it might not be related, but um, during the last 10 nights of Ramadan every year, I try to come up with my resolutions. And the reason why I do that is because then I tie them to my dua and my prayer. And I say, you know, Ya Allah, like I, I want you to help me achieve these goals. And I remember a couple of years ago, um, I prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for time. Because so I thought to myself, look, there's, I just don't have enough time I'm running your kids, have a child, a wife. Uh, by the way, like at Nora Kids, like we were very bootstrapped, really trying to make things work. And I, I thought to myself, look, I don't know how Allah is going to answer this dua, but I know that I should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this dua. And Allah did answer it. And so unlike most people who have 24 hours in a day, my, I actually have 27, which, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. That's, not, that's not how it worked. What happened is Allah introduced people into my life. So now we have a team of 17 people, for example, and we created the means and the structure and the processes such that now, um, you know, instead of having to work a, a, a insurmountable amount of time that, that leads to depletion, uh, it's, it's, it's a time that's more reasonable and perhaps the quality of my work is also improving. I don't know if that's an example of Baraka or not, but I'm curious when you use that word, like help describe some like physical characteristics so we can touch, feel, and see it. I think there's many ways that baraka can manifest, and the, what what you described is certainly there's baraka in um, resources, and there's baraka in Allah facilitating more to happen, and and that may be by people giving you you know gi giving you help, but there is a reality to having you know more than 24 hours in the day, and and in the sense that not technically, obviously, there's 24 hours in the day, there's certain natural laws, but there are also spiritual laws that we have to recognize and we can't deny that. And I think what we tend to do is we tend to accept this materialist paradigm that only looks at the physical world and say, you know, we can look at studies about in science about sleep, that we need eight hours of sleep. And if you are you know, going by regular life, that expectation, yes, you need eight hours of sleep to be for your body to rest. But if you are re, um, sleeping less and in the time that you're replacing some of that sleep with, you are doing what? Doing, following the sunnah of tahajjud. 
and you're getting up in this special time of the night that the Prophet Laysatasam has told us about that has baraka in it. You know, now you hear all of these things, this miracle morning, all, there are all these things about people saying that there's this magic time in the uh, late night or the early morning where you can you get a lot more done. And this is in the Islamic tradition for, from the beginning is that when we prioritize things that are aligning us with being able to tap into this, um, being filled up with Allah's resource and not just relying on ourselves to have more time by doing more and keeping more busy, that notion of like, well, I need to do more so I get more done is, is this insular thing of saying like, well, things happen because of me and I'm mm. going to make everything happen. Whereas a baraka sort of paradigm is, is recognizing that there's something bigger than me and that Allah actually can, can, can um, have a, an impact in our life when we open to it. And when we do these things to tap into that baraka. And so ibadah and all of these practices people tend to see them as transactional things. Well, I'm supposed to do this. And if I put my, you know, do my ibadah, then I'll be saved or something. But really they're supposed to be transformational. By right. doing the ibadah, it's supposed to transform you so that you're in a state, in a different state. And in that state, you are relying less on yourself. You're relying less on your own self-direction and you're open to, uh, submitting and surrendering to Allah's will and then through that allows for more to happen because it's not you that's making it happen necessarily and so I'll give you an example from my own life is that I, I have a practice that I, I get up in the middle of the night and so in order to do that that means I I get less sleep because I have three kids I, it's you know I, I, I have the same demands on my time as most people and so I could say, well, I don't have the time. I don't have the time for that. But instead, I prioritized it and said, well, all the other things have to fit around this. I don't know if you're familiar with the seven habits, but Stephen Covey talks about placing big, big rocks first. Uh, so it's like that. You know, when we put these things in place and we prioritize them, what I have found is that when I get up for Tahajud and I do get less sleep, I get less than the eight hours, I have much more energy. Hmm. I'm able to do twice of the amount of things that I'm able to do. And the times that I've, this is, I have experiential practice and knowledge from this, the times that I have missed out on that and said, okay, well, I need sleep or, or for whatever reason, I sleep my eight hours and I, get, I give up on the tajud. I'm more, I have less energy. I'm not able to do as much. I'm not as a, in alignment with myself. And, and, and I just don't feel as healthy. Yeah, I, I, man, I really appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, um, w w what I heard you say is, um, um, the time that we have can be expanded, um, and the way that we do that is by kind of putting Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala at the center of it, um, and recognizing that, look, you know, with this idea of God consciousness, like it's not just me. My success is just not me. If I put in X amount of hours and I will get Y out, well, remember, there's a Z factor that has nothing to do with the amount of time you put in uh, right. that has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's focus on that Z um, that maybe is a blind spot that you don't even think about. Um, I think that's really, really fascinating. And also the, um, you know, the concept of, um, um, of, you know, seven habits of highly effective people. And, and, and I think what you're alluding to is this idea of like, hey, if you have a jar, if you put in the big stones first, and then you put in like the small sand afterwards, well, what will happen? The whole jar will end up being full. Whereas if you put the small sand in first, and then you put the big rocks in afterwards, well, it's going to take over the time. Um, and so a, a great kind of hack around time is to prioritize the stuff that matters first. And I, I'd love to double click there. But before I do, I, I do want to talk about self-care because I think that you brought that up. And also, um, as I think about our audience, this is something that would potentially be really valuable. Um, briefly talk about what is self-care and why does it matter? So 
I mean, self care is what it sounds like caring for the self, but it's, it's, you know, like you said, we get depleted, we're trying to do all these things, and we get depleted, and then we can't maintain. And so self care is, is get doing things that we need to do to get to a state of equilibrium, where we can maintain, we can manage, we can stay above water sort of without sinking. Um, and, and so what that has become in the world where the self is defined as this projected notion of who we are in the world that really is about this isolated notion of our identity as separate individuals which we tend to really be um, uh, sort of trained towards in this world that we live in that can become what, what makes me feel good Right, so you hear often if you Google self-care, you'll probably hear about hot baths and aromatherapy and maybe yoga and you know, getting your nails all, done, or your hair, your nails, yeah, going out with the girls and having a you know doing doing the things that make you feel good. That's really healthy and that's really good in in proportion. Right, we don't want to what that can then easily turn into. We're just coming off the month of Ramadan where we're trying to keep ourselves from doing what we desire, right? We, 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 we desire food, we desire all these things that our nafs wants. And so self-care can turn into nafs, like feeding into the nafs, the nafs mm. being that, that part of ourself that, is, that sees ourselves as separate. And that is sort of, we have tendencies and we have wants and needs. And so, Often what self-care becomes in, in the world we live in is just caring for my tendencies and doing what I like. And so do me, right? I'm going to do me. Now, I, think, I think, Dr. Abla, it's, it's um, I'm going to do me. I'm going to do me. There you go. You got it. All right. Very good. Yeah. So, but, you know, doing me is good for when you're having a really hard time and you're so depleted that you just need to, you just need to, you know, like I, I eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream every once in a while and it, and it's, that can be self-care and that's healthy. But if I do eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's every single night, that's not healthy um, physically, or it also starts to sort of emotionally be blocking me from dealing with what I need to deal with. And, and, and then it becomes this sort of bypassing the work that we need to do. And that can easily become self-care. can be like, hey, I'm going to do me every day. Whereas in Islam, we're, we're told to actually sort of, um, you know, control the self and control the desires. And this is what Ramadan is about. It's about, it's not just about um, fasting so you know what other people are, feel like when they're mm. hungry. It's about controlling your, uh, it's about self-discipline. And so then from an Islamic perspective, the self is defined in a much bigger um, notion that involves the spiritual, emotional, cognitive, everything, and that it's connected to Allah. So therefore, from an Islamic perspective, caring for the self is important. It's important to care for ourselves because we are Khalifatullah. We are, we are representatives of Allah on this earth, and we have the ability to be noble and to have this high character that is represented in the character of the prophet and that is our birthright so therefore there's a nobility of caring for the self because there is something holy about it but in order to really allow that holiness to shine we have to also deny the self and we have to discipline the self and so then from an islamic perspective self-care as much as it needs to be grounded and rooted in compassion and mercy for the self and love and, and this notion that we are worthy, you know, not, not pushing down the self because we believe that we're sinful or evil, we, we, we have a high status. But then caring for the self means being honest with the self and, and not covering over. So the word kaf, kaf, uh, um, kufr is, comes from kafara to cover over. Mm. And oftentimes what we do in self-care is we're just covering over the, the stuff that we need mm. to work on. There's, there's a problem, take, we see it, but instead of actually trying to fix it, we, we put a Band-Aid on it. Yeah, yeah. And you take it. So it's, it's, you're not being real with yourself. You're not actually saying, hold on, there's a real problem. Let me explore it. Now I'm, so I wanna pair it back what I heard you say, and I wanna double click on, on a couple of different things. So 
what I heard you say was, you know, number one, look, the, w- there's a physical element, right? Where, where it's like, hey, you know, the here and now, it could be eating a tub of ice cream for me. It's playing Age of Empires, right? Sometimes there's a point in time when you need to just kind of take care of yourself. Okay, fine. Alhamdulillah. But we should also rec- uh, recognize, and, and I think what, what, what I teased out was two specific things. One is, it's not just about caring for your, like, quote unquote, body or your bodily needs. There's also a caring for your spirit. And perhaps self-care for your soul might look different than self-care for your, you know, tummy or, you know, or, or age of empires or whatever that might be. And so I'm kind of curious about, like, what is self-care for the soul? Like, what, what might that look like or, like? ways someone could do that. And then the other thing that I heard you say, which was fascinating is you said, well, here's the thing. Self-care doesn't just mean that it is all mercy and all compassion and all like lovey-dovey, like, hey, you know what I mean? Just take the the next two months off because you're tired. Um, No, there's also an element to say, well, you have to be real with yourself and that might require discipline and that might require work um which i find to be r- real that is that is the lived experience of my life often <laughs> um and i'd love to just kind of try to figure out well how do you how do you actually do that so i, I realize i asked you two different questions you asked so. me two questions i think i can merge them together so the the first question is you know how do you sort of feed the spirit and this is, you know, nourishing the ruh. We have this ruh aspect of ourself that is that, that pure part of ourself that knows a lot. We come from this place where we, we know where we came from. We witness, we, 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 we have this place that's not covered over. And we always have that. And so feeding that spiritual aspect is stuff that, like ibadah, but it's also um, things like self-introspection or muhasaba, meaning taking the time to reflect internally, be with the self, reflect on why did I do that? What, what did I do? And then muraqaba, oftentimes people think of this as meditation, but really it's about um, watching the self and taking the time to slow down and be with the self. And, and so when we do... so. Ibadah or spiritual practices like Salat and reading Quran and doing dhikr, these things feed our spirit because we are tapping into this notion of something outside of ourselves and we're reminding ourselves of Allah. And that can really nurture and be this caring for the spirit. But then what often we, we tend towards is a lot of people who especially grew up around Islam as this thing that was sort of used to hang over their head like you have to do this and if you don't you're going to be bad and you know and and so what happens we have this damaged relationship with Islam and really with Allah and so therefore that ibadah becomes we think of it as this transactional thing like I said before so it's like well I just need to do my prayers because otherwise if I do my prayers I'm good if I don't do them I'm bad and so if I just do these things then I will that's what, you know, people say like, oh, well, if you're a true believer, then you shouldn't have, be depressed or have anxiety. And that's completely uh, wrong. And what that is, is it's called spiritual bypassing. It's when we go to these spiritual practices or beliefs instead of doing the work on ourselves. And what, what the real path is in Islam is both. The spiritual practices should nourish the soul and the spirit so that you can then be in a place to do that inner work. And then, so the second part of your question is that inner work is the, the uh, in order to know this, I always say, you know, so there's a saying, he who knows himself knows his Lord. The fact yeah. that you have to reflect internally to really come into contact with the reality of Allah. And this, this, this notion of know thyself, K-N-O-W, I would say in order to know thyself, K-N-O-W, you have to know thyself, N-O, thyself. Meaning you have to say no to yourself to certain things. There's certain things that we want that aren't good for us. And, we ha- and self-discipline is, a, is, a, is a unavoidable, it is part of the path. 
it is part of how we come to polish the gem inside of us and mm. to come into really um, maximizing our potential as human beings. So we, we, we're running out of time here, but gosh, there's so many places I, I, I want to go. So now I'm forced with a need to prioritize a little bit, okay? Um, and, and I want to just share a couple of things that I heard you say, and I want to reiterate it to the people who are, who are listening. So with respect to self-care, I, I, I heard you provide, I think, three very specific things that people can do to help nourish their soul. The first one is to worship God. Um, for example, prayer. For example, fasting, for example, charity, uh, for example, vicar. These things, if done correctly, they should actually be putting gasoline into our system. And if it's not, then that might be something for us to reflect on to say, wait, hold on. Like, how am I actually approaching, you know, these, these acts of worship? That leads into number two. You talked about muhasaba and muraqaba, which is this reflection and accountability, um, you know, reflecting perhaps, uh, and I don't know if you have a, 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 a guide in terms of, is this something that you recommend on a daily basis or a weekly basis, or if there's kind of like a best practice with respect to this, but a kind of reflection to say, hey, look, am I, you know, why did this happen? Am, am I on the right path? If I made a mistake, what, what, you know, what could I have done differently in that personal accounting? And then the third thing I, I heard you say was uh, being able to say no to yourself. Um, and being able to kind of rein in the, um, the desires. That was a great synthesis. I appreciate that. I, I take note. I, I've been taking notes. I've been taking notes. So now I, I, uh, I, so with the time that we have, I want to ask yeah. you two questions. First, okay. Mohasiba and Morakaba, like what best practices can you share about like tactically, tangibly? Yeah. How, how should I actually do this? Great. First, I just want to say the first thing that you said about, you know, the ibadah, if we're doing it right, I just want to clarify, and I know you didn't mean it this way, but a lot of times people are so caught up on the, the form that it keeps them from actually doing it because they're so worried about doing it right. Right. And, and, and so what I think you meant and I, by doing it right, meaning if you are coming to it from a place of genuine um, intention to connect with Allah and not from a place of oh my god I have to have everything in the right place and if I don't then it's not valid well look you know you should pursue that knowledge and do it well but that oftentimes keeps us from being able to be in a state of khushu yeah mashallah so I'll, I'll share I'll just share a quick tradition um, uh, and I believe this is attributed to our holy prophet peace and blessings be on him someone asked how do I know that our prayer is accepted responds by saying well if it makes you a better person um mm -hmm. and i think um it goes to intent right you know and even yeah. when we think about the intent it's not necessarily to check a box um, um although like look in different times of our life maybe there's different intentions and, and you know i, I don't want to say that one is like completely wrong or anything like that but i think the the point is that if we approach prayer from an intention to make us better to allow us to rebuild our connection and to fill that uh, that um, uh, account or that that tank, I think is a really thoughtful uh, approach. Yeah, and then to feed into that, this this things that you can do practically, muhasaba and muraqaba, they these practices should uh, allow you to be able to do that. For, to, should should deepen your approach to ibadah so that you can benefit from it in this way more. Because what what these practices do is make you uh, present and, and self-reflective. And so what we need to do, what, the reason why we sometimes don't get what we should be getting out of ibadah or prayer or salat is because we are not in a state of hudur or presence. And the whole idea of salat and the whole idea of ibadah is to be witness to Allah, to be in a state of hudur or presence with our Lord. And that takes learning we have to learn how to do that we have to cultivate a state of islam you don't just you know just because you're not just muslim just because you were born muslim you have to cultivate a state of islam and so that takes some daily cultivation so your question of how it has to be a daily practice i mean you can work up to it and it doesn't need to be super long it's it's about constancy 
it's better that you do something five minutes every day than if you spend two hours one day and then next week you spend half an hour and then you do a retreat for a whole week and you, you're in this blissful place, but then you go back to your life and do nothing for two weeks. It's, it's about the constancy. And Allah tells us he loves things that are constant. Consistent. Yeah, absolutely. So, so practically, is that, is that before you go to sleep? Is that when you wake up? Like, like how, how? Whatever is going to be able to make it so that it's reliable. So, so you have to study your life and know when it's best. Now, there are sunnah for that. Like there's, there's times, obviously with the, the prayer times, we don't, you know, there, there are specific times. Uh, it, if you are praying, then it's easy to attach it to that. Like, so if you've got the prayer mat out and you've, you know, and you're going to take five minutes to pray, take an extra five minutes and make that a 10 minute thing. And then sit on the muslaya on the prayer mat, either before or after. I, I would recommend before so you can sort of put yourself in this state so that then maybe your prayers would be deeper. And so what that means is taking some time to be still. You know, there's all kinds of things we can talk about in depth and detail, but we don't have time. But really, at the simple level, it's just <sighs> practicing being still, practicing being in your body. Don't worry about the thoughts are going to keep coming. You don't worry about like, well, I can't because I'm always thinking. We all are, our minds are overactive. But if just forget, a, try to a, move away from the, the, the center of your location of yourself being here and try to drop down into this being the center of yourself and have an experience of what it feels like to be centered here and just practice being still. And breathing really helps with that. So I would say that is the primary core practice that is going to, this is the essence of how you get into a state of hoshu. People talk about, I don't have hoshu when I pray. Well, you need to cultivate it. You need to practice it. Hmm. And then, so I would say that is the main, that is a really important thing that should be practiced to some degree, at least five minutes daily. And then I recommend people keep a journal, a muhasaba journal, where they're just reflective. So Al-Ghazali talks about doing this at like an accountant at the end of each day, taking account hmm. of what you did. And you can use the seven limbs uh, as all gateways to the heart, you know, our um, eyes, our ears, our tongue, our genitals, our hands, our feet. These are all things that we interact with the world and sort of question ourselves. What did I do with my hands today? What did I look at today? What did I hear today? What did I say? What did I do with my feet? Where did my feet take me? And take accountability for yourself. And this is how we come closer into the opposite of Kafara, so we're not covering over our truth, we're exposing our truth and being real with it, and therefore knowing ourselves and coming into a state of knowing our Lord, inshallah. Wow, mashallah. Wow. And I, I think this is a great place to end on. Um, Dr. Abdullah, it was so exciting to hear um, as uh, you kind of took us on this journey um, first around helping us think a little bit about do we want to be the best version of ourselves? And kind of asking that question. I think uh, many people as myself and anyone who's part of a group that is uh, trying to boost their parenting superpowers are trying to become a little bit better. And what we recognize is that becoming the best version of ourselves doesn't necessarily mean that we are increasing our output X to Y. There's a Z factor and that Z factor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so um, by remembering that, reminding ourselves of that by putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the center through, for example, worship, through, for example, waking up at night and talking with Allah, uh, it recognizes this and perhaps it's a source of barakah. And through this barakah, we have the opportunity to turn 24 hours a day into 27 hours a day, not physically, but kind of, no, I'm kidding. Um, and we also talked about this idea of self-care and that is, look, in order for us to become the best version of ourselves, we have to invest into ourselves. We have to make sure that that tank is not running on E. We talked about three specific strategies in order to get there. One is around prayer. Um, using prayer as a tool to recharge us. We talked about number two, this concept of reflection and accountability. And specifically, Perhaps having a diary or a journal where you're able to record, what did my eyes see today? What did my 
Um, what, what did my ears hear today? You know, what, how did I use my hands today? Um, so that way we're able to uncover perhaps some of the areas of our life where maybe we've got some problems or we need to fix. Um, and then also reflection, perhaps tying that to our prayer, maybe before we pray for five minutes on our prayer mat, that might actually allow us to connect better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, um, this idea of uh, to know your soul, self, uh, uh, self, you have to say no to yourself. And that is um, sometimes um, uh, loving yourself and loving your um, giving the care that you need does include ice cream and age of empires, but not all the time. Um, and, you know, being able to say no, um, Allahu Akbar, those, those, those are awesome, awesome, uh, reflections. Um, and so, um, Dr. Abdullah, um, I want to, on behalf of, you know, our entire community and, uh, the, the, the parents who, um, have been following and joining us on this, uh, broadcast to say thank you for giving us the time. I'm wishing you, uh, Fatima Zahra, as well as Sharif and Wafa, um, the absolute best, inshallah, on your journey from Abu Dhabi to Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, and really, really feel enriched by the conversation we had. Jazakallah khair. It was my pleasure. And uh, I think we packed a lot in a short period of time. You're telling me, man, I, and I, I'll tell you, like, I've still got so many questions that I want to ask you. So maybe inshallah in the next, uh, the next time. Now I have to ask, like, what does it mean to be the principal of the Cambridge Muslim College? Or like people are like coming into your office and you're like, hey, you know what? Now you're in the principal's office. That's, that can't be it, right? Yeah, I mean, that kind of. I mean, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't take a, a punitive approach. I have an open door policy. People feel welcome to come, I hope. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm in charge of the academics and the caring for the students and the programming and the uh, sort of running the college. Wow. So now if people want to learn more about you or the work that, that you do or to stay connected, how what would be the best way for them to either find you or perhaps other resources that they might be able to check out. Cambridge Muslim College .ac .uk is where we have uh, all the programs going on. And we just, I, we just started a, a diploma in Islamic psychology. Uh, and then my work through the International Association of Islamic Psychology, that there's a lot of resources there. If you want to learn more about Islamic psychology as a discipline, as a field, that's islamicpsychology.org. And then my own personal work, sort of my talks and my, um, my practice is uh, shifacounseling.com. Uh, and I have, a, I have a blog there where I, where I post sort of my, write, my writing and my talks and stuff like that. There's a lot of videos and podcasts and articles. That's awesome. Dr. Abdullah, it was such a treat. Inshallah, we'll see you later. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.